Hi everyone, um, this is Marie Novotny coming remotely. Um, I'm going to share with you today uh, an example of a project that I worked on with a senior digital marketing student, Krista Mahan, um, called Sperm Stories, which was a social media um, campaign and research project in which we tried to kind of intervene in um, the current uh, reproductive justice framework around infertility and really target some information and understand um, how it is that we can break stigma um, that still exists with infertility amongst men in particular. So just a brief overview, I can't spend a lot of time on this um, for time purposes, but essentially our argument um, is that reproductive justice when it comes to infertility is frequently linked together. However, um, that conversation is frequently constructed from a heterosexual and female oriented position. Um, that is reproductive justice needs better access to um, fertility related treatments like IVF, etc. Um, but within that frequently what's lost um, are male perspectives, male experiences as well. And so Sperm Stories was trying to understand how it is um, that men feel represented within the infertility community, um, how stigma still exists in that, and then how a social media digital campaign um, could perhaps offer a, a more expansive reproductive justice framework um, that includes uh, male infertility and male infertility um, from both a cis and then a queer perspective as well. So to briefly go over this, um, like I said, what we were interested in was to test the effectiveness of a male targeted infertility social media campaign. Um, this idea uh, came to mind when I was meeting with Kristen during some of our mentoring meetings. Um, and she noted how there were tons and tons of Instagram and Facebook pages offering support and educational resources. Yet most of those um, pages were either um, run um, by women about um, infertility or they were pages about infertility targeted strictly um, and purposefully at women itself. Um, and so the idea that we wanted to kind of play with was how is it that we could um, create a different um, social media page that's targeted at men and learn a little bit more about how social media, again, um, could connect with men experiencing infertility. And when I say experiencing infertility, I just want to be clear that I mean not men who are strictly diagnosed with infertility, but men who are trying to build their families and uh, for whatever reason, if they're in a same-sex relationship or in a heterosexual relationship or being a single parent by choice, they're having difficulty um, fulfilling their family building pursuits. So the two questions that kind of guided the, the research project were how may men experiencing infertility engage and interact with social media campaigns like sperm stories. So here it is that we're trying to kind of understand um, what social media engagement effectively looks like um, for men. And then the second question then, what type of content do men experiencing infertility desire from a social media campaign like sperm stories? So um, dependent upon that engagement, what type of content is effective, um, specifically looking at educational content versus uh, supportive content that features more stories and community building. Um, and then the research process, which I'm going to go over really quickly in a minute. So to inform the design of this research study, um, Kristen partnered uh, with the Art of Infertility, one of my organizations, um, and was able to come to Los Angeles during June of 2018 um, to help us install, but then also collect um, ethnographic observational data um, through our exhibit that we were hosting, Reimagining Reproduction, the Art of Infertility in Los Angeles. This was um, an exhibit that was focused particularly around male experiences with infertility. Um, and we had a series of programming um, featuring male stories, um, male uh, specialists and neurologists um, coming in and talking about um, new methods and insights moving forward in terms of family building from the male perspective. Um, here we can see an image of a couple actually um, engaging and interacting with some of the art. Um, and the exhibit itself. Kristen was able then to, um, especially coming as a 21 year old college uh, cis female, um, to kind of connect and understand more about infertility itself with the male perspective. So she was able during this exhibit, um, one, to collect content through the art and stories, talk to some individuals who um, were attending the event, learn from the storytelling sessions that were happening at the event about male experiences of infertility, and then ultimately recruit some individuals who participated in the event um, to take part in the survey uh, following the actual running of the social media campaign. So when we returned from Los Angeles, uh, Kristen created a Facebook page for Sperm Stories and then an Instagram page for Sperm Stories. Um, sperm Stories was essentially the idea that we were going to tell stories about male infertility. Um, and so she created those and I'm going to explain the content that was included. So for the content for Sperm Stories, uh, Kristen really followed essentially um, this 30, 60, 10 percent social media rule um, in which 30 percent of the content was owned by the art of infertility and that 30 percent 
um, of the content that was put out on Sperm Stories uh, was reflective of owned content. So this is an example of one of those posts where here's a, a piece of art, a photo that was actually taken um, by a male participant, and then um, the narrative that attaches to that story. So that's an example of one type of post. Um, and these would we were um, basically labeling as more supportive types of stories, right? They allow personal connection into a story or experience around male infertility. 60% then of what we put out was also um, curated from other sources. These were more educational sources. And we try to use reputable sources as well. So for example, this is a post um, that we reposted essentially from the Turek Clinic um, about how to make healthier sperm. And then 10% was promotional, simply the idea to get um, more information out and available um, about sperm stories itself, and then also invite people and recruit people to be part of the actual um, research project. Um, so as we were doing that, we also created a series of survey questions that we wanted to test in order to better understand engagement with this campaign. So at the beginning, we're asking um, general demographic information about infertility. And then towards the end, we added um, more specific information about individuals with where they go to get information about infertility, um, as well as what types of information they found useful or helpful um, from, from what was posted on Sperm Stories and to provide examples of that. So then this is a little bit of the results that emerged through this project. Um, you can see um, just in terms of demographics with who participated, everyone who participated needed to be a male who identified as having some experience again with infertility. Um, so you're going to see that um, not everyone right uh, had necessarily male factor, but you're going to see essentially that 57% of the individuals who participated in this had some sort of male factor that was contributing to their infertility. Um, only 9% had the female factor issue or 28% actually had a combination. And and you're also going to see in terms of demographics, um, it's important essentially to understand how many years individuals were dealing with infertility. Um, so we had a large amount of participation from individuals who had five plus years of dealing with infertility. So this whole shaded area is five plus years. Whereas um, those who are relatively new in their journey, we had less participation. And perhaps that's because they were simply uncomfortable um, or still felt the sense of stigma attached to it. So here, one to six months, um, only 4.8% of the participants um, identified as relatively new with infertility. Um, and I should mention in total also um, that we were aiming to have a small pilot study of 25 participants. We ended up with 21. So this isn't a huge study at all, um, but it's a small type of snapshot to kind of um, track further progress and further research as we move forward. Okay, um, the coding and then analysis of results. So we wanted to know, again, some of the resources used by men for both support and for education. So we wanted to know where do men get infertility support, right? Where do they feel connected to this community? Many of them reported um, their spouse or their family, right? Um, so these two sections. And that's significant because I think that still points to how infertility from the male perspective is still somewhat protected. Um, it's still isolated. It's confined to the home or the family, right? Um, whereas 0% actually go to social media to feel some sort of connection, right? 17% um, actually reported nowhere. So this is where the intervention and the Sperm Stories project is really trying to um, intervene and unpack the idea that men don't feel supported. Um, in terms of where do men go then for infertility information or education, we see that a lot of them go to the internet. Um, a lot of them also go, not a lot, but so, some of them do go to social media, so 7%. Um, some go to doctors and then the spouse as well. So there's more resources and access for information, um, or they feel at least that there's some. Um, there's less in terms of actual support. So for desired content, um, when we asked them, what type of content did you find useful, helpful? What were you looking for when you went to Sperm Stories? Um, we wanted to know specifically, do they want more educational pieces? Do they want more support pieces? And the result was pretty split. You can see 48% said personal stories um, and 52% said educational. And here's some anecdotes to kind of explain or express this a bit more. One person said, I think I like the stories more. My experience with infertility is not new. If I was new to this, I might look for scientific articles for inspiration or hope. I think I'm well past that point in my mind. Um, so the idea again, right, that if you're relatively um, advanced or have resolved your infertility for whatever reason, um, the actual personal stories and support might be more useful than the educational how to fix or resolve your infertility. Um, on the other hand, though, this person wrote, I want scientific articles. It's painful enough to know that I can't have kids. I'd rather read research and learn what can be done, right? And so the idea um, that they're not really looking for support, they're looking for action steps to move forward. Um, and that was pretty consistent um, with other anecdotal evidence that we received. Um, then when we looked for just general social media engagement, what emerged and what we did not predict was this desire for privacy. Um, 
within social media uh, marketed campaigns around women, um, there's still a mention of stigma, but I think the stigma has become more reduced. People are more willing and open to put their stories out there. Um, and by people, I mean women in general um, and heterosexual women in particular. Uh, yet you're going to see um, in some of these anecdotes, men felt a real desire um, and, and need, honestly, um, to remain private. Um, so in terms of engagement, um, there was a general um, sense of both both using both platforms, so both Instagram and Facebook, to kind of um, go and check about about sperm stories um, a little bit more um, skewed towards Facebook than Instagram. Um, but then to go back to the sense of privacy, right? Um, some of the participants said, I set my Facebook account to private and have been following on Facebook and Instagram because I wanted to read about other men's experiences and see that I'm not alone and that there's a lot of other men suffering from the same problems as me. I am not alone, right? So this um, type of story is basically describing um, and expressing a need to not feel alone, but yet a really deep need at the same time um, to remain private and not let um, others detect that he's following these types of conversations on Facebook and Instagram. Um, the second anecdote says, the only so social media pages I visit is the Reddit male infertility subreddit. I'm embarrassed by my condition and I don't want anyone, especially my coworkers, to find out about my infertility. The Reddit forum is the only place I feel comfortable enough to be myself and get support because I can use my alias and no one knows my true identity. So again, the sense of stigma um, that's still attached to experiences of infertility and this need to be anonymous um, is really prevalent um, and remains so amongst um, the use or desire to use social media uh, for support and education and infertility. And then finally, um, another person suggested a different way forward um, in terms of connecting with others and then also getting educational information. They said, there could be an app we could download on our smartphone and it could provide local specialists and other resources that might be useful. Um, this was an idea that we keep going back to and thinking a little bit more on, especially if you think about the number of apps that exist in terms of fertility support, um, treatment, tracking that are geared almost always towards women. So Glow, for example, right, is a period and ovulation tracker, um, but it's used frequently for women. Now there's, there's an app that you can attach to that for men. Um, but again, it's, it's a sub app is what I would basically call it. So how is it that we could become more explicit into the app development and privacy around that for men um, to get information as well as support? Um, and then quickly to conclude, I just wanted to kind of draw some connections or some ideas to think about in terms of what this project means for reproductive justice interve interventions in social media or digital spaces. Um, we can see from a lot of the data that we pulled that privacy is still very important for men dealing with infertility, um, mainly because stigma still seems to be attached. The stigma for women, if we looked at um, another similar type of pilot study, I think would show the stigma is less apparent. Um, yet for men, it's still very much there. Um, so one person wrote, maybe in the future, I would share my story. But as of right now, I don't think I would. Even on Reddit, the Reddit forum, I only shared my personal story through private messages. So far, I've not publicly posted my story. Right. So the idea that story is important, it kind of gives a witness um, to these experiences. But there's a sense and a need to um, protect from others knowing that story unless there's a sense of trust established. And for whatever reason, the Reddit forums um, seem to establish some sort of trust. Um, so thinking a little bit about if privacy is still important, um, what may social media do, right, um, to to protect with privacy? Um, and then another claim. So stories are important to coalition building and breaking down perceived stigma, right? Um, so the idea that uh, by learning of other people's stories, you feel less alone, less isolated, the stigma gets reduced. Um, one person explains this when we asked them what types of articles they found useful um, from what was posted on sperm stories. They said the link to the article, how one man learned to open up and accept his except as infertility, um, because it encourages other men to talk and open up. The article Male Infertility, I felt so guilty that I couldn't come up with the goods because it shared the guilt, shame, and stigma men feel when they are the reason for their infertility. Also Ben and Caitlin's story, because it focused on he supported her and what the guy can do to support his partner. So again, the idea that men are clearly connecting to these stories, that they want to hear these stories, they feel less alone and isolated. Um, but if there's an issue of privacy being important, how is it that we can um, re resolve those tensions um, between the need to tell stories and build coalition and community, um, but also be mindful and respectful of privacy? Um, and then another person wrote, I felt connected to some of the guys who wrote about the ordeals, mainly because we had a lot of commonalities, right? So the sense of feeling supported, right, by telling each other their stories. So given that, um, this project kind of led us to think a little bit about that social media may and then may not also be a space to foster connections, foster support, foster community building. So we asked the question, would you use social media to connect with other men experiencing infertility? And we got a range of questions. One said only anonymously. 
Another said, probably not. Support groups are not me. I think social media is still a support group. I think it's a I think it's possible social media to be a good resource for men, but for me, it really has to provide really good benefits for me to subscribe. So the sense of um, questioning what the benefits of social media are, what its purpose um, motivations are. There seems to be a lack of trust around social media in this person's comments. Um, and then l lastly, I think I would because reading and viewing all these posts actually made me feel more comfortable and a bit more confident because I realized that a lot of men suffer from infertility, a much bigger number than I expected, right? And so some people feeling motivated and encouraged by listening to other people's stories that they could maybe tell their own. Um, so thinking a little bit about if you have a, a reproductive justice um, topic issue that you're passionate about, if you want to contribute to advocacy, thinking critically about what your demographics are um, and how the space of social media in particular um, both empowers, but then also can disempower or create issues around trust um, for those particular participants. Um, that's what we learned a lot with um, Sperm Stories as a project, is that social media may not always be the best space um, to foster a sense of connection. Um, and that's because there's a real sense of needing to be guarded um, and to, to protect um, one's experience around being a male and infertile. Finally, I just want to offer one broader um, type of claim um, that Sperm Stories offers really a pedagogical design for expanding traditional notions of reproductive justice work at the university. Um, specifically, it offers a way to reimagine reproductive justice allyship. Um, and by that I mean, when Kristen and I started this project, Kristen had very little knowledge of infertility, um, and especially male infertility. Um, but that this type of project, um, when you're fusing it and doing an inter interdisciplinary um, research design, um, can really foster larger connections and ideas around what is reproductive justice, what counts as a reproductive justice issue, expand it beyond um, what I think often students perceive as reproductive justice as access to abortion rights, um, which is always um, much more than that, as we know. Um, but I also think that this project illustrates for individuals um, and academics um, who might not have a lot of research time, but have a lot of um, mentoring or pedagogical um, responsibilities at their institution um, to, to do new t forms of mentorship, essentially, around reproductive justice um, with their students. And I think that this um, project really models um, ways for 